historical record of the Vietnam. Beautiful. Now, Warren, I hope. Yeah, no, I I want, Cal, you introduce Warren. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to notice I will introduce Warren. Uh, all I know is, is I, had, I had a few comments up here about four years ago, and Warren had to correct me on a couple. So, uh, Warren is very knowledgeable, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Let me set that one up for you. I'm not as young as I used to be, so I'm using uh, the stool there. Uh, okay. If we can have the lights, please. Uh, just before, while they're taking down the lights, I want to show you something that I just received today from Florida. It is a Laconia Car Company uh, nameplate. And uh, at the end, uh, if you remind me, I'll, I'll read you a little bit from uh, the gentleman's letter. Uh, it's not the same nameplate as you see on the screen. That is uh, an earlier version, which uh, you'll see on some of the cars at the uh, seashore, and also the uh, scenic railroad up at North Conway and some other places. So that I don't forget it, I want to read you a little something uh, from a speech that was given in 1907 by a local minister. Um, I, I assure you that it is relevant. What I was trying to get out is that during the life of the car company, there were many periods of time when they were they closed. Uh, they either didn't have orders or couldn't get material, or for whatever reason, uh, they would shut down for a month, two months, three months, a couple of years, whatever it might be. So here is what the Reverend Lewis Malvern, who was the minister at the South Baptist Church here in Laconia, I had to say, on September 9th, 1907. Uh, this was a speech to the local Evangelical Ministers Association. And I quote, the car shops were not running when I came here. The first, the firm was called the Randlett Manufacturing Company. I remember the first time I saw the smoke coming out of the foundry furnaces. I sincerely thank God for the site, knowing it meant so much for Laconia. The firm consisted of J.C. Moulton, Joseph Randlett, and Pearlie Putnam. But afterwards, they did a million dollar output in a year. It was always considered our leading industry employing so many heads of families. They had very many faithful men and some of the present firm who have worked there nearly all their lives. The story of the fires of this company, and we'll show you some pictures of some of the disasters that they had. The fires of this company would indeed be startling. How we feared when it was said, it is the car shops on fire. We felt they might move to some other place. Reports would circulate that they had sold out to the railroad company, but they are here more secure and as well managed as ever. Now that was in 1907, and this was after Frank Jones, the beer baron from Portsmouth, had taken over the company. We'll get to that in a moment. Before I start in on the actual history, I want to uh, pay homage to O.R. Cummings, who many of you knew, uh, an authority on trolley cars and uh, many other items having to do with rail. Uh, my talk is based on a, uh, I'll call it a monograph, an essay that OR put together and gave to the Laconia Historical Museum Society. OR had planned to do a book on New England car manufacturers, but he got to be about my age now, then, <laughs> and decided that he probably wasn't going to be able to do that, so he gave us the chapter on the Laconia Car Company, and we have his notes and uh, photographs and so forth, and that's what this talk is based on. O.R. was present the first time I gave this in, 19, in 2005 at the Laconia Public Library, and um, I, I cherish his memory. I also want to say that uh, whatever you read on Wikipedia about the Laconia Car Company, forget it. 
throw it away. It's not that it is that wrong, um, it's just incomplete. It's based on uh, work done by a man named Hayes Hedrick for the Mid-Continent Railway Museum in Wisconsin. I don't know where Mr. Hedrick got his information, but uh, it's uh, woefully inadequate. Uh, it's also in inaccurate, in my opinion, because he says that Ranlett started making sleighs and wagons and that sort of thing. A lot of car companies did start that way. It's my understanding that Charles Ranlett came here uh, to start a company to build boxcars, and that was uh, exactly what he did. Um, unfortunately, the influence of Wikipedia is all pervasive, and our very own Fritz Weatherby came here to Laconia to record a program about the car company once. Of course, it's a five-minute snippet, but it's basically the Wikipedia nonsense. And furthermore, somebody didn't brief Fritz. He didn't ask me. Uh, he stood down here outside the mill and made it out as if the car company was right around this mill, which, of course, it wasn't. It's four football fields in that direction. So if you know Water Street here in Laconia, it's the brick buildings on both sides of Water Street. And I'll be, be showing you some pictures and talking a little more about that. One final uh, blip about Wikipedia. <laughs> I took a look yesterday at the reference to Hayes Hedrick's item. And guess what? It will bring you to the material I gave the mid-century, uh, mid-country, mid museum in Wisconsin to replace Hedrick's stuff. So I get the get revenge at the last. So if you, if you just go down to the bottom and click on that, you'll find the material I sent them four or five years ago to replace Mr. Hedrick's. I don't mean to slam Hedrick's. I'm sure he did the best that he knew how, but I don't know how you write about the Laconia Car Company from the middle of Wisconsin. Whatever. So, as noted, that is the nameplate. That's one of their products, apparently in 1912. Well, and these two, these two, of course, are at the uh, Seashore Trolley Museum. I was running that one yesterday. Excellent. Uh, it is a lot of fun to ride on both cars. I. I think I've ridden on this one, but I have ridden on 38, which I don't have a picture of. I love the little postal car that was on the York, Maine uh, line, sorting the, sorting the mail as they went along. Now, this is a, an engraving from the 1892 atlas published by Hamilton Hurd. And it's a, an atlas of New Hampshire and has, in addition to the, to the maps, it has uh, a number of engravings, and this one is how the car shops looked in 1892. This is Water Street, right here. Those of you who know the Ristfrost Shumway building, which is the four-story brick building, built in 1894, that will be right here. This is not it. This is, this is the building that burned down in 1894. Uh, most of this burned down in 1894 and was rebuilt. Uh, so I don't forget it. I will tell you that the with, the, with one exception, the buildings on the north side of Water Street were built in 1894. The one exception is the building where Hector's Restaurant is at one end and the Winnipesaukee, uh, the Winnesquam Printing is at the other end. That building was built in 1908 and was the steel underframe erecting shop. We'll see pictures of it in a minute. The buildings on the south side of Water Street were built around 1908-09. Uh, and uh, oh, with, oh, I'm sorry, with one exception, the passenger car erecting shop was an 1894 building. We'll show you pictures of that in a minute. This is the 1899 version from after the fires and the rebuilding, which uh, is taken from the Illustrated Laconian, a book published in 1899. They put new batteries in it. Do you want to try that one? All right. We'll see if not. 
We're going to try again and see if that works. So this is the um, 1899 version. This is wrist frost Shumway. This is Water Street. Uh, this large lake over here is actually the Winnipesaukee River. Obviously, the uh, engraver took some liberties. Of course, the main line is down here. Um, all these buildings at the bottom, of course, are gone now. They were taken down in the 1980s, but the uh, chimney is still there. It's exactly 125 years ago that that chimney was being built to replace a chimney that was a mere 75 feet tall. This one was 100. About five years ago, we, we I say we because uh, we have a building. In fact, uh, that is the building that the Laconia Historical Museum Society owns. Um, and we're a member of a condo association. We own the building, but not the land under it. And the condo association had to spend large amount of money to take the top 18 feet off this chimney and repoint the whole chimney. It was a lot cheaper to do that than to take the chimney down. So what you see here is um, foundries, machine shops, freight erecting shop, paint shop, my building, the Laconia Historical Museum Society's building, is actually two buildings in one. Half of it was a stable because they used horses in 1894 for certain tasks within the plant. And the other half of it was the paint storage building because the fire in 1894 had taken down the paint shop which had the paint stored in it. And of course, you know what happens when you have fire and paint. It was quite a show, I guess. Uh, the other, other buildings, you know, stacks of lumber, et cetera, and so forth. Um, at a later time, starting around 1900 and continuing off to the west toward Lake Winnesquam, we'll see some pictures in a minute, um, was an expansion, mostly, mostly for storage of lumber and steel, but also for a, another large paint shop and other buildings. I guess I should uh, remark that when this all started in 1848, when Charles Ranlett came back to what was then called Meredith Bridge. Uh, where you're sitting was part of the town of Meredith in 1848, where you're sitting. The other side of the river was part of Guilford at that point. Guilford, Guilford broke away from Gilmerton in 1812, so prior to 1812, the other side of the river was part of the town of Gilmerton. And Charles Ranlett was actually born in the town of Gilmerton. Uh, it is said that he was a Guilford boy, but he was four years old and when Guilford was formed, so he actually came from Gilmerton. Um, this is just a lovely color postcard looking toward Lake Winnesquam off in the distance. And uh, uh, the, this brick building is still there. Uh, it's now made into condominiums as is the building next to it, which was the passenger car erecting shop. The freight erecting shop would have been over in here. Um, this wooden building was the office for the car company for a number of years. You will see that building earlier where the brick building is. It was moved across the street when the brick building was built in 1908. Um, a question that came up at the last time I gave this talk was, uh, oh, there was an office in Boston. Yes, there was for quite a period of time, but it, then it moved back to Laconia. You know, of course, the Boston office was strictly a sales office, um, and then it moved back to Laconia and moved into that white building, and the white building was still there until our urban renewal program 50 years ago when it was torn down. Uh, these are going to be awfully hard to, to see from a distance. These are Sanborn insurance maps. And uh, they're basically of the Water Street area. This is Water Street. This is the Molten Opera House, now no longer there. Bootleggers, uh, shoe store, MC Cycle, and so forth are there now. Beacon Street West comes down through here. 
This is the Hector's restaurant at the far end. Actually, Hector's restaurant is not in any car company building. The, the extension to the building that they are in was built by the Laconia Shoe Company, which came to town in 1937 and took over the building. And, and over the years, they added that extension. Um, the building next to it is the paint shop. This is the You would think I'd know what I'm doing with this thing, but anyway, this is the four-story wrist frost building, the passenger car rifting shop, cabinet shops, and uh, various other buildings. All kinds of machine shops and uh, blacksmith shops, etc. cetera. The uh, Sanborn insurance maps will uh, answer any questions that anyone has about what was there at any one time. The Sanborn insurance maps started in 1868, I believe, and were published until 1948. Uh, not every year, but uh, and they are available on microfilm at large historical societies, the State Library, and Concord, etc. And some of them, of course, are online from the Library of Congress, so you can look them up there. This is just another detail. Water Street again. Obviously, um, while well, those of you who are familiar with Sanborn maps know that the pink buildings are brick and the yellow ones are probably wood. They could be tin or some other material. Uh, and just one more time, this is Hector's up at this end and this is the steel underframe erecting shop, paint shop the four-story building, uh, which was built as a foundry on the first floor, machine shop on the third floor, and uh, storage and so forth on the other floors. Uh, of course, there was an external elevator even in 1894, so they made it work. And again, this is the Historical Society's building uh, next to it. Passenger car erecting, cabinet shops, another uh, brick building. Uh, the only reason I show you this one is to show that they got around finally to putting a spur into the uh, plant. In fact, there were several of them. And not only was there a standard gauge spur off the main line, but there were uh, narrow gauge uh, tracks as well, which they used to move materials around. Um, there's one not shown on this map, but uh, I guess we'll see it on another one. There's the remains of the main spur that came in by the foundry. It used to go all the way uh, across Water Street and down by the river. Uh, but as the portion on the south side of Water Street has been taken up. All right, we are now on top of the Wrist Frost Shumway building, four stories up. And this is 19, uh, 2005, and I got as far as the hatch to the roof and chickened out going any further, but our executive director at the time, who was nine months pregnant, went out on the roof and took the following sequence of pictures. You are looking at the right there at the paint store, the paint, uh, I'm sorry, this is the paint building. This is the steel underframe erecting shop. You're looking at the railroad station off in the distance. And we're just moving around in a clockwise direction. Um, that's the Historical Society's building here. This side was the paint storage. The other side was the uh, stable. Um, in some of the older pictures, you will see the cupola on top of the staple part of it. Obviously, if you've got horses on the first floor, you've got to vent the building. And so in the older pictures, you'll see the, the cupola. Um, this one over here is a cabinet shop built in 1908. There are actually two buildings there, with an, originally with an elevator between them. The elevator served both buildings. They were both cabinet shops. I, I believe that the, 
I believe that this one was also a cabinet shop. Uh, we're coming again around clockwise. The cabinet shops are at the extreme left. This building, which is now condominiums and apartments, was the passenger car renting shop until about um, 19. Oh, 91, or something like that. There were three sets of tracks that went across uh, Water Street from the buildings on the north side to the south side. Uh, they rebuilt Water Street at that time and took those tracks up. Same time they took up, they took up the uh, cobblestones. Water Street had been cobbled. Again, the building in the foreground is the passenger car erecting shop. Uh, the Allen Rogers Company, which was a wood turning company, they made doorknobs and Easter eggs and all kinds of different things, uh, used this area this area had stacks and stacks and stacks of lumber. Of course, that's all been removed in uh, 2005. This gives you a rather dramatic look from the top of the wrist shop, Frost Shumway building. This is Water Street. There's the chimney. Now I want you to look off to the distance because you see our police station. The car company extended all the way past the police station to the lake. There's the lake. And we'll see a little more of that in a minute. Uh, just an indication of the expansion of the shops toward the lake, which started around 1900. And uh, I believe that this big paint shop, this is uh, Fenton Avenue over here, um, that New Salem Street and Fair Street, they were not connected until 1937. 1937 was a very good year. That's the year I was born. <laughs> In any event, there, there was this huge uh, paint shop and Fenton Avenue was off the screen at the top. The lake is off the screen at the left. This is a big crane. We're going to see that in a minute. There's the crane. Uh, this is at the end of things. The car company has gone out of business and everything's in sort of rack and ruin before it was taken down. This is looking uh, back toward downtown from approximately the uh, position of the crane. The lake is directly behind you. Now we're back at Hector's restaurant. Is right here, uh, and we're just going down the line. There's the Historical Society building, wrist frost towering over it. Just another, and we're looking down Water Street. This is a cabinet shop, now condos. This is, I mentioned the wooden buildings. This one is the one that was moved over here um, in, in 1908. Uh, these two wooden buildings were built as shoe shops. Uh, the car company built them as shoe shops and rented them out to a shoe company. Uh, and, and the shoe company went out of business eventually and uh, they were made into apartments, tenements. And then in 1908, when the brick buildings were built, on the south side, the side of Water Street. As I mentioned, one building was moved across the street as a new office for the car company, and the other building was torn down. Uh, you can see all the houses and so forth, uh, how it looked back then. Uh, this is Water Street right here. This is one of those tenement buildings that I mentioned. Now we're moving toward the river, backside of the buildings on Water Street. And we're getting closer to the end of the Pearly Canal, which is right here. 
And then there it is again. You can't see too well, but this is the Burley Canal grading here, and that was the wheelhouse. The Burley Canal begins behind the Lagonia Spa up the river, up, up river from the dam, runs down through downtown, and ended up down here at the edge of the river. You can, if you go across the river and look back, you can still see some vestiges of where the tail race was. As far as I know, it only powered the uh, car company and successor buildings. Allen Rogers, the wood turning company, was still deriving 10% of their electricity from a turbine in that wheelhouse until they went out of business in 1991. Uh, so originally, the car shops used water power. Obviously, as time went on, they moved to steam and then later to electricity. A combination of steam and electricity at the end. Here you are looking across the river again. This is the back side. I told you there were two buildings side by side. This is the one nearest the river, and that's the one you see on Water Street. This one's the car, uh, passenger car erecting building. This building fell down in a snowstorm in 2007, so it isn't there anymore. That's what the car shops looked like in 1848. We don't know if Charles Randlett uh, built these or if he purchased them, but uh, the canal came down between the two buildings and was on the surface there's an engraving on an 1860s map that shows that. I should add that to this presentation that shows you that the canal was uh, above ground at that point. But that's what it all started as. So we can group the history into these uh, five or six periods, the founding expansion, Frank Jones, reorganization, and the last years. I wanted to go back to Charles Randlett for a minute because, as I say, he was a Gilmanton boy, born in a part of Gilmanton that became part of Guilford. I'm not exactly certain where, but his first job as a young man, and I don't know how old he was, I'm guessing 15, 18, something like that, was as a machinist in this building, in the Belknap Mill. He then went to Exeter, he went to Newmarket down near Durham, and then he went down into New Jersey to a town, uh, New Gloucester, which no longer exists by that name, but is in New Jersey right across the state line from Philadelphia. And there was a company making railroad cars down there. We don't know if Charles Randlett uh, worked there, or if he even knew of it, but it's kind of tantalizing to think that he might have. Now, why did he come back here to his hometown, which by when he was a young man, this was known as Meredith Bridge, because as I mentioned, where you're sitting was still part of the town of Meredith, and Gilmanton was right across the river. Uh, and he was 40 years old when he came back in 1848, so he was not a kid, and uh, everything I've read says that he came back with the intention of making railroad cars here because he knew that the Boston, Concord, and Montreal Railroad was coming in that same year. He knew that there were um, machinists and carpenters and other laborers available here. He knew there was a great deal of good lumber available here, and of course, producing his railroad cars, he, he could ship them out on the railroad. So that's why he came here. He, he only lived another 13 years. He died in 1861. But meanwhile, his brother, who had been the Joseph Randlett, who had been the master mechanic of one of the mills in Newmarket, joined him here in um, 1849 and stayed with the company until he retired in 1878. Uh, but meanwhile, after Charles Randlett died, 
um, a, a man named John Carroll Moulton, who was a big player here. Uh, he owned a lot of real estate. He had been postmaster. Uh, he built the Moulton Opera House, which we mentioned, and a number of other buildings. So he joined the company, and then uh, later a man named Pearlie Putnam, who was also postmaster at one time, it seems to run in the, run in the family there, uh, took over. As I say, Joseph Randlett retired in 78, so it was Moulton until he died in, I believe, 1889 or thereabouts, and then Pearly Putnam until 1902. But meanwhile, of course, Frank Jones took over in 1897, so we'll get to that in a minute. Now, up until um, around 1870, the company concentrated on making small box cars. I believe they were about 20 feet long, seven feet high, and had four wheels under them, not trucks as we know today. I have seen a picture in a book. I, I have never been able to find it again, but I have seen a picture in a book in a library. I, it was either Boston Public or it could have been the New Hampshire Historical Society. The picture is of some passenger cars attributed to the Randlett Company early on, and they look for all the world like little stagecoaches with four wheels under them. Uh, it's the only picture I've ever seen of the very early passenger cars. I think by 1870, they were making cars that would look more like the cars that, that, that we are familiar with. Well, in 1881, the plant was burned to the ground, lost everything, but they rebuilt. Oh, before we get back to the rebuilding, this is an advertisement that appeared in the Laconia Democrat in 1849. And basically he says that, that he is uh, now ready and prepared to manufacture passenger freight, baggage, and gravel cars. It's kind of interesting that the last three pieces of rolling stock that the company ever made were three grout cars in 1928. I'm not certain what a grout car looks like. I'm not certain exactly what the, what the grout looks like that they're talking about. Um, people who work in, in quarries tell me that it's, it's sort of like a gondola car or something of that sort. That's Moulton, and that's Putnam, and that's after one of the fires, and another fire. I don't have dates on these, but there were multiple fires from 1881 until 1894, and then there were a couple of smaller fires after that. But up until 1894, the buildings were mostly wood. And in 1894, they decided to go with brick. Incidentally, a great deal of the brick came from Hooksett. There was a uh, brickyard down there. We had a brickyard at the Weirs, but uh, uh, the bricks for the car company, to the best of my knowledge, did not come from the Weirs. The bricks for this building did not come from the Weirs. The Belknap Mill bricks came from an island in the Winnipesaukee River called Eager Island, which is down at the end of uh, Water Street. That's Water Street over there and the wooden buildings that we've been talking about and some of the foundries and so forth. One of the many fires. Do we know how many employees there were? Oh, the number of employees that worked, of course, varied over the years. Um, early on, I think he got up, I think Randlett probably got up to oh, 150, 200, something like that. Later on, it was 450, 800, 900, 1,000. A man named Lewis Purley, who uh, was a, a, an engineer, a, a civil engineer here in town. As a college student, he worked at the car shops, and he said they got up to 1,500 at one point. And he also said that when the noon whistle blew, 
every day, 1,500 employees streamed out of the buildings and up Water Street. That must have been a sight. Yes. How many employees were there in 1881 at the time of the fire? I don't know how many there were in 1881, but I'm guessing 60, 50, 90, something like that. Oh, the population of Meredith Bridge at that time, possibly 3,000, 4,000. I'd have to go check the census to be sure, but of course one of the things that's a little bit uh, disconcerting is Meredith Bridge covered both sides of the river. Half of it was in the town of Meredith and half of it was in the town of Guilford. So when you get to comparing census numbers and so forth, it can get a little dicey to know who was where. Um, and of course, people then as now would come in from elsewhere to work. I mean, they might, might live in Sandmanton, take a room here in the city somewhere and work at the car shops and go home to Mama on the weekends. They did that even back then. So uh, I wish I could give you a, a specific answer, but I don't have an answer for the number of employees. And I don't have an answer for what the what the going wage rate was. I can only tell you that my great-grandfather, who was a machinist and later had his own company and built knitting machines directly across the river, the building's no longer there. But before he went out on his own, he was working for a man named William Abel, who was just up the river. And he wrote home to the folks in Sanberton that if he couldn't get a dollar a week, he was gonna quit. This was in 1877 or something like that. So I'll let you draw your own conclusions as to what uh, going wages were. I don't know for a fact. In the newspapers, every so often they would say what the payroll was. And this is mostly later, um, in the 1880s, 1890s, 1900. Um, and so the weekly payroll could be 2,500. 4,000, something like that, depending on the year. The company went through bankruptcy and receivership in 1896-97 and was closed for the better part of two years. Frank Jones, who was a former mayor of um, Portsmouth, owned a hotel down there, owned several other businesses and had the brewery. He died in uh, 1912, however his brewery was and of course his brewery was shut down during Prohibition, but it reopened and was still producing Frank Jones Ale in 1952, 53, 54, somewhere along in there. Uh, Frank Jones obviously was a very wealthy man and he bailed out the car company. Uh, he took two years to rebuild, uh, not the buildings, uh, the previous regime had rebuilt the buildings but he re-equipped the buildings with new machinery. He also built that 100-foot um, chimney that we were talking about earlier. Um, so in February, production resumed, and for the next uh, dozen years or so, there was general prosperity. And that's probably the time period when they got up to about 1,500 employees, if in fact that is correct. I have only Lou Perley's say-so to go on on that. Jones died in 1902, but his uh, estate continued to run the car shops until 1912. And that's Jones. If I'm correct, I think he was uh, president of the B&M at one time. Uh, you're, absolute, you're absolutely correct. He was the president of the B&M, and I neglected to say that. This is the interior of one of the buildings. I think it might be the passenger car erecting shop, but I don't know. In any event, you can see that they were, were still working in wood in this instance. Uh, around 1908, they sort of shifted over to steel. I imagine they were building cars. Of, obviously, the underpinnings, the, the, the wheels and the trucks and that sort of thing would be steel, but. Uh, one of the things that uh, they took their pride in was that the sills for the car bodies were not spliced. They were oak and elm and so forth, uh, 30 and 40 feet long and fully dried. 
Uh, there's, there's quite a bit of, um, they, they took quite a bit of pride in how they dried the lumber. Of course, when Ranlett started here, there was a lot of standing lumber. As time went on, the lumber got cut down and they had to import it from elsewhere. And obviously, when they went into using steel, that was one of the things that uh, attacked their uh, competitiveness because we don't manufacture steel on the East Coast. You've got to go to the middle of the country to get it and to ship it here is an added cost. So in 1912, the estate of Frank Jones bailed out and a consortium of uh, New York and Boston banking houses incorporated it. They kept changing the names. We all call it the car shops. But anyway, uh, O.R. Cummings said that uh, the third 12 acres were added. I think they were added about 12 years earlier. Uh, I've got to pin that down to be uh, absolutely precise. But uh, in any event, in, in 1913, there was a, a continued expansion uh, into that area. Then during World War I, which was going on over in Europe, the Russian government uh, placed an order through a Canadian company for 150,000 three-inch artillery shells. All they made here was the shell casing. The casings went somewhere else and had the projectile and the powder and all that added. But um, they geared up to do this and, and built the 150,000 shells. Through 1917, orders were declining for streetcars and steam cars, and they were having more financial difficulties. You remember that Henry Ford was doing those automobiles in any color you want, except it had to be black. And uh, the automobile was coming in along with buses and so forth. And it took, of course, until 1965 with passenger service in Laconia the 3rd of January, 1965, last Budliner out of Laconia, last scheduled Budliner out of Laconia. There was, there was there have been uh, excursions since then, uh, one in particular in the 70s sometime that went all the way to Boston, all the way to North Station. That was an anomaly. That was in, uh, yeah, October 71. Right, that was uh, Wynn Buswell a teacher at Laconia High School who organized that. Well, there, there they are with some of the shells. This is just a page from the order book that O.R., bless his heart, found in a used bookstore somewhere. So we've got the sort of the second half of the car shops. These are this, not the complete order book from day one. This starts in the 1880s, 18, I think it's 1894 actually, that these orders start and go to the end. To the th three grout cars. O.R., bless his heart, transcribed all of this and put it in the computer so we've got it in uh, a better format. Now we're going to look at a bunch of products. Um, before we get any further, I want to reiterate what I told some folks at the beginning. I am not a mechanic. I am not a, a machinist. I am not a carpenter. I am not an equipment person. So I defer completely to the equipment people. And those of you that are well familiar with how to run a railroad, Obviously, this one had a snowplow on the front of it. It looks like a boxcar to me. Uh, this is, would have been an electric car because the electric cars were all shipped on flat cars. The only th reason I know that they took the trucks off when they shipped them was that the height would be too much for the bridges, overpasses, and so forth on the line. Most of the trolley cars were standard gauge. Why didn't they just hook them up to a train? My understanding is that the uh, couplers were different. Frank Judge will tell you that they could have changed the couplers. 
Uh, I'm not certain that that would have been worthwhile. I'm also not certain about disconnecting the motors from the, uh, from the wheels, uh, traveling down the track, generating electricity with no place for it to go, seems to me like there might be a problem. But in any event, and anyone who knows the answer to that, I would be delighted to hear the authoritative reason. One of the, one of the reasons was because the flanges between trolley cars and railroad cars were cut differently. Okay, so there's part of the answer that the flanges. The master car builder uh, has, two, has two different uh, uh, designs. And I think it goes back as far as the 1880s or 90s, so that might well be hard. Right. And I don't know if I mentioned it along the way. I think it was on one of the slides, but the car company started making trolley cars in 1890 uh, or thereabouts. And that was Pearlie Putnam who was responsible for the company moving in that direction. So the answer was that in addition to couplers and any other reasons, the flanges on the wheels are different. I, it has just occurred to me that I want to mention a book that you can get on Amazon or in a library somewhere. It's the Day Journals of Jeremiah Smith Jewett. This was published, uh, oh, 10 years ago by our then executive director, Brenda Polidoro, now Brenda Keene, and the journals of uh, Jeremiah Smith Jewett, who worked for the railroad. He worked in laying out the railroad in 1848, and then he worked in the railroad shops at Lakeport that continued until sometime after 1907 or thereabouts. Uh, they, they started scaling back and sending the work either to Woodsville or Concord and then eventually closed the railroad shops totally at Lakeport. <clears throat> I don't have an exact final date for that. But in any event, Mr. Smith, uh, Mr. Jewett rather, uh, worked for the railroad and one of the things that he talks about a great deal in his diary is uh, going, coming to Laconia from Lakeport to pick up wheels at the car company. And uh, so the car company was apparently casting a lot of wheels at that point. If these cars were attached, is it possible that one of the other considerations is that where the car was put in service would be where the tax rate would be applied? And that would make a difference also. Well, that's a, a question that I certainly don't have any answer for, but it's a good point. Right. Uh, that's a, an aspect that I, I've never heard of before, so it's something to look into. Of course, if you've seen one trolley car, you've probably seen them all, but we all like to see them. Of course, uh, there, there are other groups for whom I say this is an open car as a closed to, opposed to a closed car. Because, of course, with the six point something miles of track of the Laconia Street Railway, which went up to the Weirs, uh, in the summertime, this, they used the, the open cars because uh, of the heat. Uh, many of you have probably seen, this is just a selection from the catalog of different cars. I think this catalog came out sometime around 1916, 17, something like that. But the, the, the breadth and range of the products from baggage cars to postal cars to coaches to various kinds of freight cars is enormous. I would think it would be because yeah, I don't think you're going quite so fast. Well, that plus the fact that a lot of the braking that's done by a streetcar is done electrically. With the motor, yeah. Yeah, uh, kind of sort of. Um, yeah, that, that's a big deal. You just bunch of them together. That, that's a very good point. I think everybody probably heard that. that 
that it, it, the braking systems are different on streetcars than obviously on a steam train. Yeah, the, the, the coupler issue was addressed usually, as I understand, by either a combination coupler or in the uh, in the case where one would be like higher or lower uh, through a transition car. It'd be a car that had a standard coupler and a railroad coupler on one side and a transit coupler on the other. All right, so that's yet another uh, possibility uh, for uh, the reason for the shift. I want to talk for a moment about the car at the top. I'm not certain that this is a Burton Humane stock car or not. It is a stock car manufactured by the Laconia Car Company, however. In the 1880s, a man named Burton in Boston developed a, an improved stock car. What was happening was animals, horses, uh, cattle, uh, swine, were dying in the, in the cars that they were being shipped in. And a man named Burton designed a car, as again, I don't know that this is a Burton car, but uh, he designed a car that, that helped to correct that. The Laconia Car Company manufactured the first uh, I don't know how many, but the first run of cars. And then Burton took the company to Wichita, Kansas. And unfortunately, uh, they, the company perished in the uh, panic of 1893. So it went out of business, but their factory building is still there. And the Coleman Lantern Company, which is actually making uh, camp stoves, or at least the last time I checked on the internet was making camp stoves there. So if you look up the Burton, B-U-R-T-O-N, if you look up the Burton uh, car company, you'll see some information about it. Mr. Hughes. Yes. The, the car on the top there, that's actually predominantly used for pulp wood. Pulp wood. It's predominantly used for pulp wood. All right, well I stand very much corrected, but a stock car looks quite similar to those. Come right up. Yeah, the, these cars actually have doors here and here that slide. And uh, uh, yeah, it's not a stock car. All right, well, you see, I learn something every time I give this talk. I'm not exactly certain what the Navy was doing with the one at the bottom, but they were doing something. Now, everybody knows what this is. Car 100. Where are you, Car 100? <laughs> this is one of the Stanley, um, Stanley Steamer people. They, they did the, um, I'll call it an engine for lack of a better term. It, it's steam powered, but you're burning kerosene. And it, it's a combination car. I'm not certain how many were made here. Uh, the Stanley Museum, I'm not certain where that is, but is it in Maine? They came from Maine. Where? It's in Rangeley, Maine. Rangeley, all right, thank you. Uh, they published a booklet about these cars, and I cannot put my hands on my copy of it. But this is, a, I found some combination cars like this in the order book from around 1912. This one, I believe, this is one that ran on the local lines. It ran on the Belmont to T Tilton line. It also ran on the Br Franklin to uh, Bristol line. And it got burned up in 1923 when the uh, engine house uh, burned down. Uh, Conrad has put up some something about this very recently that brought several different posts from years back all together that show the, show the car, uh, show the wreckage of the car after the fire. Uh, interior. I always like this one because some of those were still running on what we now call the red line. It was called the, the Cambridge line, I guess, in Boston. Uh, 
last one of these was running in, I believe, 1961, 62, something like that. Uh, the Laconia Car Company got an order for 20 of these, and another company got a copy for 40. So there were 60 of these manufactured, but we did 20 of them. A question came up on, uh, I guess it was one of Conrad's uh, pages, about the interior of a car. And from this diagram that you see, we were able to say that no, the picture that was shown, which had seating facing forward rather than the side seating. So these cars were made, unless it was retrofitted, which I doubt, uh, these cars had just had the seats along the side. Center entrance car. Uh, I want to talk just a minute about uh, the market for these cars. Basically the East Coast, basically the main central Boston and Maine, Boston Elevated, and other New England uh, trolley systems and rail systems. Yes, the car company got orders in Indiana and Ohio and Nevada and a whole bunch of other places. No, the Laconia Car Company did not make cable cars. No, the Laconia Car Company did not make the rail cars for the Los Angeles uh, rail system, which our friend Mr. Weatherby told the world they did. They did not. Um, so the last years, um, as I say, the problem of shipping in steel from away the cost of it was a problem. There had been some indication of aging management. Uh, who knows what else. So they decided, among other things, to use up a bunch of lumber by making boats. Something called the Sportster and the Speedster. I'm not, I've not found anybody who thinks that they were really wonderful boats. Uh, there's one on display, I believe, over at the a boat museum in Wolfboro. I think that Merrill Fay may have one at his boat yard at uh, Glendale. Uh, so they did make, there'll be a picture in a minute, they did make a few boats. They also made, uh, they call them caravans, I would call them a camp. Uh, they look like little uh, Airstream trailers except made out of wood. Uh, a diner or two, this sort of thing. And then the last uh, shipment of trolley cars was to the uh, Boston Elevated in 1928. And then the company liquidated over the next three years. So you can say that they lasted until 1928, or you can say 1931. There wasn't any production after 28. Uh, we mentioned the, uh, an order that they got right after World War one, the government had federalized the railways in the states during the war. So at the end of the war, they had to reno renovate the rolling stock before giving it back to the railroads. The, uh, so the government gave a contract to the Laconia Car Company to refurbish roughly 4,000. I believe the final number was something on the order of 4,000. 556 or something rail cars and down off Bay Street, this is Bay Street, Lake Winnipesquam, um, Court Street, Deja Vu Rec Cafe down here. So this area where later the French Dye Works and then Carpenter Patterson had a factory, today it's a condo into warehouses and small factories. It simply says many tracks, but there were many tracks. And looking up the track toward Laconia from the west, uh, the many tracks would have been right in this area. That's Bay Street up there. And this is just what's there today. Well, we're, we're sort of come to the end of 
This is just a couple of, oh, well, here, here they are working on boats. And of course, they expected to come back into business, so they kept the department heads and the watchmen and those types of people. Uh, there's a couple of ladies in there that were probably clerks in the office until the end, but uh, that was the farewell picture. So, I would be glad to take any further questions that you have or entertain any comments anybody would like to make. Yes? Yeah, a couple things. You made reference to the uh, Lakeport shops. Yes. And, and uh, yeah, I, I have only assumed that with that much manufacturing capacity here, for the foundry and so on, to make wheel sets and whatever, uh, that they probably marketed well beyond just their own manufacturing. Uh, yeah, as a, you know, and ship them out of here, uh, not just to, to BCM, but elsewhere. Oh, I think you're absolutely right. And, and I, if I went back through the, through the order book, we'd probably find good evidence of that in the order book. I mean, there were a lot of, uh, I know they made wheels, but they were also had orders for trucks. So, uh, Like the Concord car shops, those weren't built, I guess, in 1910, right? They're about, they're about, yeah, yeah. That, that was the BM's foundry in later years. I know, um, like the Cog Railway, the cars are there. They, Oh, I'm glad you mentioned the Cog Railway. There were at least two. There may have been three that the car company here made. I was wondering. Okay. Yes. Um, the superintendent of the Cog for many, many years was a man named Horn, H-O-R-N-E, who lived in Lakeport. And once a year in the spring, it would say that Henry Horn was going to uh, up to the Cog Railway for the summer. And then in the fall, it would say that Henry had come back. Um, <laughs> But yes, they, they made at least two, I think they may have made three uh, coaches. A couple of other tidbits I just want to, uh, in reference to the, to the manufacturing that was here. I'm not sure of the exact date, but probably in the 50s, maybe into the 60s, uh, Malleable Iron was a separate Boeing concern that was a railroad customer. Now, yes. What, it was called Mountain Blind. Yes. I, I have only assumed that that was what was left of the Mountain Lion shop. Uh, absolutely. Okay. They absolutely. The, 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 it was one of the earliest parts of the car company. And uh, you're absolutely correct. In 1931, when everything else was gone, was liquidated. The Malibu Lion, Laconia Malibu Lion continued on and they continued until about 1987, 88, something like that. I have to look it up for you to be sure, but uh, then they finally did go out of business. Now, but I've seen waybills for there, uh, you know, from the line. Uh, right. They came out of the station in Plymouth or, or Ashland or whatever, but you know, they were just from the station, uh, the agent, or actually maybe it was Lakeport. Mm -hmm. But um, there's another little tidbit, I, uh, buy or leave. Uh, you mentioned Alan Rogers' company. Yes. And their uh, wood turnings and so on. In 1971 or 70, they shipped a 40 foot boxcar from here to Florida <laughs> containing a carload of golf tees. That was one of the things that they manufactured, yes. <laughs> Try and imagine how many swings you get with a carload of golf tees. <laughs> It is indeed, the golf tees along with the Easter eggs for the White House. But of course they made a lot of other things. Alan Rogers made, uh, and any of you who were in, in the Army at any time, remember what a field desk looked like? Alan Rogers made field desks during World War II, among other things. Um, more, yes? Warren, the last time this complex was served by rail was the early 80s, about eight about 82. Well, I was going to attest that uh, in the Wolfboro Railroad operations there in 1976, I recall being on the train one day when we went into Allen Rogers with Walton, and I can remember that the fires were going in both si on both sides of that long sweeping curve track, uh, Maconian Malibu Line. Right. The track was and another uh, Time stamp that I can attest to is that in 1982, they received a, 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 
a substantial amount of pig iron, which had come from out of the country, I believe, was delivered by ship to Portsmouth to the state pier, was loaded in the orange Boston and Maine gondolas that were new at the time. They were, weren't new after that. <laughs> they were loaded in, and uh, under the North Stratton Railroad operations, they were delivered, unloaded by a crane with an electromagnet. There was one heck of a pile of, of uh, big iron for a long time there. And what's kind of amusing is the last car is one that some rocket scientist in Portsmouth decided could clean up the last of the load. And so they got the last of the iron in this one poor car. I could look the number up, and that would be a loser, <laughs> I'm sure. It was well overloaded. And so we were joking about how that became the BM's bridge test car. <laughs> and to make matters worse, the car got misrooted all the way out to East Vietnam before it finally got EDCO back, to, back east and delivered the Concord, delivered uh, to the North Strat, and we finally got it home. And poor 1008, the Alco switcher that was running uh, the freights for the most part. Uh, the boss, the illustrious James T. Moore, insisted that that engine would do just fine going up Northfield Hill with loads of pig iron spacers because of bridge restrictions in Concord and loads of propane, nothing, nothing light. There was no, pack, no load of packing peanuts that day. And we crept up Northfield Hill. He had me opening all the doors to try to keep that engine from overheating. Just stubborn as he was. But big iron for Laconia in 1982. Thank you. That's very good. Yes. You say you have the order book. Yes. I don't have it with me. No, but is that something available at the Historical Society? Yes, you could come and, by appointment, you could come and see us. Best thing to do is shoot us an email. We will arrange a time. Sure. Yes. I understand out of the Strasburg Railroad, they had a couple of these cars that were on the B&M. Mm -hmm. Is that true? I'm sorry, I didn't get all of that. I understand a couple of these wooden coaches from the B&M out at the Strasburg Railroad. Uh, you may well be right. I don't know that. Maybe somebody else does. Yeah, that's true. They, they have about 11 of the original b and splitter fleet. And you can tell because when they, they cast b and in the truck trains, every one of them, they had, they had the malls for the railroad and also for at least New Haven. Uh, when they got an order for boxcars or passenger cars, whatever, those trucks had the road and they cast right in them. Yeah, and they're, they're still there. They went there in the, my God, the late 50s, I think. Yeah, and they did a beautiful job yeah. restoring. Oh, that's right. That's from 85. Some of them went by Nelson Blount in 1967. That's very likely to. Uh, White Mountain Central has a lot of logging trucks up there made at the right They're stamped upon the car company right on the well, I, I think I mentioned earlier that I was going to fess up to this plate that came in today from Florida. This is one of the later plates. I know you can't see it, but uh, it, it, it came, it, it appears to be quite genuine because uh, I've got a letter here from the gentleman who gave it to us, who tells the name of the scrap company that scrapped some be some car, Laconia cars, and uh, they got permission to take, take the plate off. So we do not have one of these. We'd love to have one. Yes? The, the, that plate that you showed just now, that was the same plate that was put on the Laconia company boats. In fact, oh. here about, about 25 or 30 years ago, and I used to have that Putting boat show up here at the Weirs down docks. A man came down from Vermont with a Laconia boat and showed it to me. And that's the first time I recognized it immediately because it had that plate on the dashboard. What was interesting about that man sitting there and he's got a period outboard motor on the boat. 
And I asked him, where did you get the, mo the motor? He said, it's not mine. I came in here with a modern engine on it, and the, uh, the museum people didn't like it. They had this motor, it does run. <coughs> the three guys from down took his motor yes. off and put that one on for the show, then the person who was over. He said, no, it was really confusing. Well, that's, <laughs> that's pretty neat. That is pretty neat indeed. Now, the other one when I was up here with Paul Cummings in that speech 17 years ago, the local woman got up and told about how her father or her uncle was a foreman for the Coney Car Company. In their backyard, they had one of the most deluxe privies she had ever seen in her lifetime. It was full of cherry wood and mahogany and everything else in there. <laughs> and at the time, it was still there, apparently, in the backyard. So I don't know what have happened to that. I suspect that my house, I have a beautiful, beautiful newel post on the, on the staircase. And I have an idea that may have come from the car shops. I think that they, they probably did do. I mean, it legitimately came from the car shops. I'm sure that they did. At some point, we can turn the lights on, because we don't really need to still be in the dark here. Okay, so in 1939, a man who had been the chief draftsman for the car shops and some other people started making kits of, uh, I guess, HO, anyway, one of the gauge uh, models and, uh, and, and started selling them. They, they were, I guess initially they were in one of the car shops buildings but they later moved somewhere else. That lasted two or three years. And then the company was sold and went to California and continued for a while. And I believe it then moved to either Arizona or New Mexico or someplace. And I don't know that it's still uh, in existence. Some of the kits are still in existence. You'll find them on eBay or Amazon or someplace. someplace. That raises an interesting point. When, when they folded up the shop here, literally, um, did they, do you know if they like sold or licensed uh, processes or patents or anything like that, that you know, for things that they did here uh, to other companies, other manufacturers? I don't know that answer specifically. It's something I'll keep my eye open about. The impression I get is that when they got to the end, you gotta remember this is 1931. Remember what happened in 29. So th things are, I, I think that they, first of all, in 1931, they, if they hadn't already boarded the buildings up, they boarded them up, obviously, to keep the tramps and one thing and another out. Um, but my impression is my father always said that when they were going through liquidation, they sold nuts, bolts, steel, whatever they had, you know, for 10 cents on the dollar. And uh, locals bought some of it, and people from away came in and bought it, whoever had some money. Um, the uh, Allen Rogers Company came to town, as I recall, in 1934. Um, that was three years before I was born, so I don't remember it personally, but and the, the shoe company came in in 37. So um, up until 34 on one side of the street, everything was vacant and the same thing on, well, except for the Malibu Lion. The rest of the buildings on the other side of the street were, were vacant until 37 when the shoe company came in. No, I'm sorry, I'm just waving, but. Mark, someone mentioned about they made HO trains at the car shop for a while. Just to mention, at the station in our exhibit, we have some of those HO boxes with the kits still in them in a glass case at the Laconia station and some of those over there. My understanding is they were initially made in Laconia, then the company went to California, and then they went out of business. Correct. Yeah. That's, that's my understanding. Now that's based on Mr. In Mr. Google. Mr. Google told me that. Yeah, I can can still find them online to buy the kits. You know, some people still have them. I, I believe that's true. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? Yeah. yeah. I'm going to mention they made diamonds. Um, diamond, I assume these are typical diamonds. Do you know if there's any still in existence? I don't know that. Um, 
I'd love to see one. The only um, camp, what did they call it? Caravan. caravan. The only caravan that I know of, and I've never seen it, belonged to Jim Dodge, uh, father of the chef, Jim Dodge, and was somewhere on Lake Winnesquam, and I believe it's still there somewhere, but I've never seen it. And as far as the diners, I, I don't know. It, Conrad, that's your next mission, to find, a, find us a Laconia Car Company diner. Yeah. I think there's somebody, yes. yes. Um, I do want to say this to people here who are familiar with the Conum Saki seating. That wooden baggage car they use is an office up there. That is a Laconia baggage car. A lot of people don't know that, but it is. It's a, as far as I know, it's the only wooden baggage car from Laconia that's still around. Of course, the other group of Laconia cars, standard gauges, is Strasburg Railroad, Strasburg, Pennsylvania. They've got about six or eight of Laconia built cars. Straight in the sound, you go out to Fulton, California, it's part of the, that narrow gauge operation. They have a standard gauge, they call it the, the California Big Pines of the Pacific. I may not be right on that, but they got the three. Passenger cars when the Wolf Pro Tourist Railroad shut down and they're running them out there. And uh, I've gone and I really wrote on them out there quite a while ago. But, uh, Were those Laconia cars? They are Laconia cars. Good. Yeah. Now, the thing is, Strasburg, and people got to watch out for, you got to get to their roster to figure out which of the Laconia cars, because many of them were built by Poland. But they all have on the trucks, they all have Boston of Maine, B and M passed into the side of the trucks. On those cars at Strasburg and also the ones out there in California. Yeah. That information, although it's voluminous, is in Roy Hutchinson's um, all time B and M passenger car roster. Uh, he published in the bulletin over a number of number of years. And I, I know he, he went to great lengths to annotate or whatever uh, or footnote where cars originated from, where they ended up, and so on and so forth. And I know the Strasburg cars are listed in there specifically. Yeah. With their Strasburg numbers. Great. Yeah. And that is on the BNF Web Historical Society website. Just our initials, bmrhs.org. And you can, you can find that roster there. Warren, see We'll talk a little bit about railroad. When you and I have spoken on the phone, maybe where there's so many people here, they might not answer to you. Remember we talked about the, the tower or the shanty that was on Main Street? And you've heard a rumor that it still existed? All right, I have the expert with us today who can tell us about that. The shanty? The tower. The tower. I believe, yes, I believe the tower is uh, in and I haven't seen it, but I've heard that the tower is currently in Webster, New Hampshire. And it was moved when it was, it wasn't torn down, it was moved away. Oh, moved. And it is currently on a farm in Webster, New Hampshire. And I know the people, but I don't know if they want me to tell you where, <laughs> where it is or whatever. But it, I believe it is intact, yes. Excuse me, is, would that be the crossing watchman's shanty that was opposite the Laconia station? Uh, it wasn't exactly a shanty, it was a, a two-story tower. Yeah. And there was a milk shed next to it and a section shed which were both moved down the track and are there today right by the Water Street crossing. But the tower is what we're talking about and uh, as, as I have told other audiences, I'm sure you all know it, but during, up until, I've forgotten when the tower was built, I want to say 38, 39, something like that. The man that was in the tower, and it ran the, ran the gates at Main Street, the crossing gates. And he got drafted, or anyway, wound up in the service, and his wife took the job over and did it all during World War II. And the, 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 of course the gates were still there until I don't know how late, uh, probably by 1950 or thereabouts, they'd been removed. I can uh, uh, attest that uh, both Pleasant Street and North Main Street had gates, manual yes. gates, a, a uh, shanty next to the uh, crossings. 
And then in about 1955, plus or minus a year, uh, all the signals in Laconia were modernized and some of the semaphores were replaced with searchlights. And flashers that were put in in the 1920s were replaced with newer signals. And at that point in time, I think the, ship, the elevated crossing watchman's tower was installed and uh, the engineering to the circuits and details for the signals reflected that even when I came on in 76 uh, for the Wolf World to maintain signals. And uh, when it came out of service, I'm not sure if I look through some of the information on the revision dates of those plans, I might be able to come up with something. But it would have been up until the 60s, I believe. Well, I know for a fact that it, that, that tower was functioning during World War II. It certainly was there. But exactly, I mean, I, I probably have it in my database, but I'd have to go looking to find out when they, I don't have it in my head when they, when they actually built it. I do know this, that um, it was probably around 1955 or six that a local banker I think he was a banker, Enjoy Harriman. It was in the summertime, actually it was my birthday, the 17th of June, and we had been at the Weirs, at the Howard Johnson's, that was the big place to go and back then, was the Howard Johnson's, to celebrate my birthday. And we came home, <laughs> my father always wanted to uh, be at the railroad station if he could contrive it when the trains came through. That was a big deal when I was a kid, to watch the trains come through. You know, there was this one at seven going north and one at 7.30 going south, so we'd park at the railroad station and watch both of them. Great. Well, so this particular evening we were late and we missed them. But Mr. Harriman, being a banker, had a, air-conditioned automobile and he had the windows up and he wasn't listening for any whistles or bells and the crossing gates had been removed and I'm not certain thinking back to 1955-ish whether we had the, the blinking lights or not but in any event he paid no heed to the train coming and it was about halfway to Fair Street before they could get it stopped, and he was killed. So I know that there was a, a problem there. But anyway, I believe that you want to have something that you, you want to talk about. You've been a swell audience. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much.